Welcome back to Bush History. It's Monday morning. Uh, you may notice I look a little different. Most of the videos you're seeing in this timeline series were compiled on Saturday morning, spending about six hours trying to get this together after my class spent about three weeks putting these timelines together. I noticed I left out an important time period, the whole time period of the Civil War, so I wanted to make sure I got that done and up posted as well. So in time, these, this presentation will improve. If you have any uh, history questions at all, you can email me, bushhistory at gmail.com, and I will answer as quickly as I can. Once again, I'm David Bush, and I'm going to walk you through the time period 1859 through 1872. In 1859, we will start out what's called uh, the Civil War period, pretty much, with John Brown's raid. John Brown, uh, a zealot for sure, conducts his raid at Harper's Ferry, in which he wants to arm a group of slaves to start a revolution, a slave uprising, if you like. He is captured by Robert E. Lee and hanged. It is the last major event before the 1860 election and ultimately Lincoln becoming president of the United States. In 1860, we're going to have a divided election. There are four candidates. Three are actually important. We're not going to talk about John Bell so much, but John Breckinridge is a Southern Democrat. Stephen Douglas is a Northern Democrat, and Abraham Lincoln is a Republican. Well, logic di dictates what's going to happen. Abraham Lincoln wins because the Republican Party divides based on sectionalism, and Lincoln becomes president of the United States with a minority of the popular vote, but a majority of the electoral vote. So in 1861, as a result of Lincoln becoming president, the South will secede, starting with uh, South Carolina in December of 1861. Shortly thereafter, shortly thereafter, we will have the Fort Sumter incident, the attack on Fort Sumter from South Carolina from General Beauregard. Uh, strangely enough, no one is injured at the uh, Fort Sumter battle as a result of the battle, and the North will go home, will vacate the fort, just that much angrier at the South. And then, as part of the one-two punch, we'll have the, bull, the Battle of Bull Run, in which the North is expecting a quick victory, and that doesn't happen. The South rolls over the North at Bull Run, and all of a sudden the, uh, the thought or the fantasy of a quick victory is behind us, and it's going to be a long war. The South has a superior general in Robert E. Lee. The North has yet to find a good general that will be happy with. And as a result of that, the South will have a lot of early victories. In 1862, remember the Civil War is 1861 to 1865. You can see it bracketed on the timeline. In 1862, President Lincoln will pass the Homestead Act, trying to be more than just a war president and thinking forward past the war. He'll pass the Homestead Act. He'll also pass the Pacific Railway Act. The Pacific Railway Act is how we're going to get them there. Homestead Act is going to give a lot of land at free or no cost, depending on the exact situation, to people as they head west. Also in 1862, we're going to have the Battle of Antietam. The Battle of Antietam is going to be a major victory for the North, and just what Lincoln needs to bolster his popularity, because in January of 1863, he's going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation will free the slaves in rebelling states only. It does not free the slaves in in border states or in states that are already controlled by the Union Army. So expecting the South to actually listen to the Emancipation Proclamation is like expecting Canada to listen to a federal law today. But nevertheless, it changes the, the cause of the war from just keeping the Union together, which was Lincoln's original intent, to now freeing the slaves as well. During 1863, we'll also have the battles of Gettysburg and Vicksburg, and they will be celebrated on the 4th of July, which is uh, a day after both of them actually come to an end. And we will have the Gettysburg Address in November of 1863. And we uh, all know the basic idea behind that, the four score and seven years ago. Um, a minute and 30 seconds talks about government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish. And it restates the original goals of the American Revolution. Also in the summer of 1863, right around, right after the end of Gettysburg, we will have draft riots in New York as wealthy people try to buy their way out of the war by basically purchasing 
Irish, the Irish, to go, per, to go fight the war for them. Of course, they're not purchasing them. What they're doing is they're paying them, and they're paying their way out of the war, and the Irish are poor and accepting money to go fight. And now we have uh, a lot of racism that's going to occur as a result of that in New York City. In 1864, William Tecumseh Sherman is going to put an exclamation point on the victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg with Sherman's march. And this is the famed march where after he burns Atlanta, he marches from Atlanta to Savannah, destroying everything in his path, creating what's called a bloody swath. The South will never forgive him for this, and it'll be a problem after the war with all of the Southern resentment towards the North. Following Sherman's march, the South is going to face one loss after another until finally Lee will surrender to General Grant at Appomattox. It is Appomattox Courthouse is the name of the town. There is no actual courthouse to speak of. He uh, surrenders at the McLean family house, and the McLean family house is simply a house that is, has been relatively untouched. Grant is under instructions from Lincoln to be charitable to the Confederacy, and sure enough he is, and he allows the soldiers to go home largely intact with their horses and farm implements, and even allows them to keep their rifles for hunting. Well, during that same year, the 13th Amendment is being hotly debated. It will be passed in Congress, but will not actually be ratified by the states until the end of the year, and it won't be until after Lincoln's death that it finally becomes law. So Lincoln doesn't actually live to see the idea of the 13th Amendment, although it is well underway when he is assassinated. And of course, that's the whole John Wilkes Booth event. And that really turns the tide in Reconstruction because now the radical Republicans, a group that wants to punish the South, will be in power in, in Congress and they will try to control Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson is not a loved president. He is a Southerner who becomes president at the end of the Civil War with the death of Abraham Lincoln. He had been from Tennessee. He had not seceded when the rest of the Southern politicians had seceded. So he's not trusted by the South, he's not trusted by the North, and he's going to have a very, very tough time of it as a result of that, fighting constantly for what will happen in the South. Edwin Stanton will be in charge of what's called military reconstruction, which will be a five district control, it's called five military reconstruction districts of the South. At the same time, the Klan will start to rise up to protest any kind of equality that blacks will get in the South and proceed to terrorize them as history has painted very well over the years. In 1867, completely out of nowhere, we're going to get William Henry Seward and what's called Seward's Folly. Seward's Folly was the idea of purchasing Alaska. Everyone thought it's a waste of money, we don't need it, but then we get oil and then we get gold. So Alaska worked out pretty well. While we're marching west, the Indians are once again going to be a problem. Native Americans are going to be a problem. The Medicine Lodge Treaty will be agreed upon. It'll create, it'll create vast amounts of land to the Indians, known as reservations. But those reservations will only hold until the Dawes Act. This is another treaty that will be broken in the future. In 1868, Andrew Johnson is embroiled in a deep problem with Congress. He decides that he wants to fire the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. Edwin Stanton was a Lincoln holdover, and he really was trying to punish the South in order to protect him from any kind of action by Andrew Johnson. Congress has passed the Tenure of Office Act. The Tenure of Office Act basically says that Johnson can't fire anyone without congressional approval. Well, he fires, he fires, John, he fires Stanton anyway, and that's going to lead to the whole impeachment process Andrew Johnson will survive that impeachment process by only one vote, basically, basically saying the rest of his presidency will be ineffective. Also in 1868, the 14th Amendment will be passed. The 14th Amendment, also called the Equal Protection Amendment, will allow uh, blacks to be considered citizens of the United States and allow former slaves certainly to be citizens of the United States as well. And in time, that will be eroded as a result of the slaughterhouse cases, which will occur sometime later in the mid-1870s. Labor is growing, and when labor is growing, there are going to be disputes, and there, when there are going to be disputes, there are going to be unions arising. Terence Powderly will found the Knights of Labor in 1869. It will be a union of all different kinds of workers with all different skill levels, and 
The democratic base of it will be its ultimate undoing, although it will grow to be the largest labor union of the 1800s. Also during 1869, well, we have the land, we have the railroad being constructed, it'll be finished in 1869 at Promontory Point, Utah. The Union Pacific and the Central Pacific will join and the East and the West will finally be joined. This is a monumental, a monumental outcome because now not only can people travel from the East Coast to the West Coast in relative comfort for the day, they'll also be able to communicate because alongside the tracks are telegraph lines and Morse code will allow for communication from the East to the West. In 1870, shortly thereafter, the 15th Amendment will be passed. The 15th Amend Amendment will give former slaves the right to vote. Imagine that. The women are furious because they feel they should have gotten the vote at the same time, and that's not happening. But the 15th Amendment will give former slaves the right to vote, so the Reconstruction Amendments are 13, 14, and 15. 13 frees slaves, 14 makes them citizens, 15 gives them the right to vote. And as a visionary, in the same year, John D. Rockefeller starts Standard Oil. Standard Oil is just what the name implies. This is not the monopoly yet. This is not the trust. He just wants to standardize the production and distribution of oil, and in the future you'll become very wealthy as a result of it. Because things appear on the outside to be going fairly well, even though President Grant has had to endure the credit mobile scandal and the whiskey ring scandal, he will be re-elected in 1872 as a popular Republican president, and his presidency will continue until 1877, when Reconstruction actually comes to an end, and Rutherford B. Hayes takes over. So, as I stated, this video is a little different from the other videos in the series. You can see I'm wearing something different. I even have someone in the background. Hi, Michaela. How's it going? <laughs> Waving at me. And if you have any other questions about American history, you can email me, bushhistory at gmail.com. Thank you.